Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm welcoming you today to the NIGMS Pratt Program Applicant Webinar. And just a reminder to please stay on mute and keep your videos off. Okay, so today's webinar um, will be brought to you by the Pratt Program Leadership. So I'm Desiree Salazar and um, Edgardo Falcone are the directors of the program and we'll be uh, participating in the webinar. And towards the end of the webinar, you will also hear from four of our current or alumni of, um, of the Pratt program, Philip Adams, Sophia Beas, Sophia Hupolo, and Tommy Bo. So I would um, encourage you to follow us on, on Twitter, for those of you who are on Twitter at NIGMS Training. Um, you can ask us questions there or see various opportunities that are available for NIGMS funding. And any questions about uh, Pratt, please use the hash, hashtag NIGMS Pratt. So today um, we're gonna describe what the Pratt program is and then talk more about the application and review process and then give you the opportunity to hear from four of our Pratt fellows about their experience. And then we're going to take questions um, from the participants. So uh, please share your questions in the chat and we will get to them um, at chat time. Okay, so I'm gonna begin uh, with the, uh, talking about the Pratt program. So the NIGMS Pratt program is a competitive three-year postdoctoral fellowship that provides high quality research training in basic biomedical sciences um, in NIH intramural laboratories and prepares the fellows for leadership positions in a variety of biomedical careers. So this, it's competitive in that you will be completing an NIH grant and that grant will be peer reviewed. And then you will, those who get awarded will be um, recipients of their own funding. Um, so this is for work that will be done on the NIH campus um, rather than at universities um, across the country. So this is our in-house intramural uh, program. And we support research in, um, in the areas of research that NIGMS supports, so basic biomedical research. The program will provide a stipend, health insurance, and travel and training allowance, and fellows have access to extensive NIH resources, both facilities, expertise, collaborations, um, a, a large office of intramural training and education that has a, a lot of different professional development and training opportunities. And this is a structured postdoctoral training program with defined training components. So the um, curriculum principles are, are shown in the slide here. Um, so there are opportunities to get training in leadership and fellows both um, have, as part of our seminar series, have the opportunity to interact with invited speakers that will talk about their different careers um, and help learn from those folks and develop professional skills to enable the fellows to transition into to leadership roles in a variety of different careers. Um, additionally, the Pratt Fellows have the opportunity to plan a scientific symposium um, for the NIH com um, community, so inviting speakers and coordinating all the logistics of having um, running a symposium helps develop those skills. Um, communication is an important uh, principle in which fellows have the opportunity to present their research um, in, in multiple settings in our seminar series, as well as get training um, in, in uh, presenting research to the public, presenting short research. Um, previously, fellows have had training in uh, three minutes, um, presenting their research in uh, three minutes, as well as 
um, grant writing training and other communications training. Um, networking is a, it's a key aspect. So the fellows um, will all meet together regularly. And so they're in a cohort of other fellows. So they get to meet one another. They have the opportunity to interact with the directors of the program, as well as other staff from NIGMS, um, including regular um, annual lunches with the NIGMS director, John Lorsch. Um, additionally, by planning the conference and inviting speakers, um, the fellows are able to grow their networks. Um, mentorship is an important principle and fellows receive mentorship um, both from their peers as well as alumni, um, the program directors, as well as um, NI other NIGMS staff. And Fellows get to learn about the biomedical ecosystem knowledge and in particular how NIH funding works. So completing an application to the program is kind of a first step into learning how NIH funding works. Um, but we also have regular workshops and panels with NIH program staff and help guide fellows on learning this process so they can be um, prepared if they're going to continue competing for NIH grants throughout their career. Uh, we very much value diversity um, at all levels, um, including a variety of uh, the fellows have very diverse research interests and are located at different NIH institutes and centers across NIH. And they come from a wide variety of, of different backgrounds, both personal um, as well as their scientific interests and, and career goals. Um, so being part of this group, I think fellows get to develop um, working in teams, working together with the other fellows and learning how to promote inclusive and supportive scientific research environments and communicating um, to diverse audiences, whether the, that may be the public or um, folks who are very familiar with the kind of research that you do. And then lastly, um, service. So Pratt Fellows have the opportunity and are expected to, um, to participate in service and outreach activities to the NIH. Um, uh, one or more of the fellows serves as the Pratt representative on the NIH-wide fellows committee. Um, and typically fellows help um, work with the public at the biannual USA Science and Engineering Festival um, and may engage with undergraduates as part of our annual NIGMS director's early career investigator um, lecture. So just a, a sample of the Pratt training activities. So there's a seminar series that happens twice per month and fellows invite speakers from a variety of different institutions and different positions. And, and the fellows get an opportunity to learn about the research or work that those individuals are doing. Um, we have professional skills development communications training. Um, the fellows were trained in three minute talks. We did a something called a DISC workshop, which enabled us to understand our own behavioral styles and how um, what motivates us and how we interact with different people who may have different behavioral styles, um, as well as NIH funding panels to learn more about different funding opportunities and the, um, the different people who administer those programs at um, different NIH institutes. And annually, there is a Pratt Symposium and it, that just happened um, earlier this month, this year, it was um, called Diversity, Equity, and Scientific Excellence. And again, this is a symposium that is um, planned by the third year Pratt Fellows. Um, so just, this is just showing some of the speakers we have had in the last year, um, both established and early career scientific leaders. So we had um, Julie Funk from University of Arizona, Arturo Zavala from California State University, Long Beach, 
And when Michael Johnson from University of Arizona was giving his 2020 NIGMS director's early career investigator lecture, he made some additional time to, to come and talk to the Pratt Fellows about his career. Um, as well as the two speakers, Namajade Bumpus from Johns Hopkins University and Gina Poe from U UCLA, who served as keynote speakers at the annual scientific symposium. So Pratt Fellows go on to a variety of different successful careers. Um, so sh this is showing the outcomes for Pratt Fellows from 2005 to 2020 um, and shown in blue, you can see um, about 38% end up in academia. Another 30% of the fellows end up in government. Um, and this may include research positions um, at the NIH or FDA. Um, another 20% of the fellows end up in industry and 10% of the fellows are in a variety of different careers. Um, so about 65% of the fellows continue in career paths where, where research is the primary activity. Um, so this is a, uh, there are diverse career interests of Pratt fellows and it is not um, just for those who want to go on to become faculty, um, but we're interested in supporting individuals with a wide variety wide variety of career interests and, and helping um, them to support those goals. Okay, so next, uh, Dr. Falcone is going to talk about the application process and review. Thanks, Dr. Salazar. Um, next slide. Let's start with eligibility. To be eligible for Pratt, you need to be a US citizen or a permanent resident as this program mirrors the NIH F32 fellowship for postdocs. In terms of scientific focus, all research areas supported by NIGMS, which I'll talk about in, um, in just a moment. In terms of career stage, it's uh, a bit obvious, but for postdocs. And so if you are currently an NIH postdoc, we want you to have started earlier than June 1st, 2020. So that means if you started after that date, then you are good to go on, on, in terms of applying. If you are a graduate student and you're intending to start a, a postdoc at the NIH for fall 2022, we also encourage you to apply for the program. You can reach out to uh, Desiree or myself to discuss timelines. We are especially interested in ensuring that the, uh, ensuring the applicant pool reflects the diversity of the biomedical PhD talent pool in terms of background, areas of science, et cetera. Next. The NIGMS mission is quite broad as was mentioned earlier, and it includes uh, uh, the list shown here, areas in biological chemistry, biophysics, bioinformatics, cell and molecular biology, computational biosciences, developmental biology, genetics, immunology, neuroscience, pharmacology, physiology, and even technology development. Now, the only things that tend to be outside of our mission are pure social behavioral studies and or pure population epidemiology studies. But biobehavioral research is allowed and studies that connect all the way from a molecular to a population level. Those are also allowed and those fall under the purview of NIGMS for the purposes of the Pratt program. Next. And to show the, the breadth of research that is supported by NIGMS, we are currently uh, shown here is currently uh, the 23 Pratt fellows that that we support. And you can see that they are, they come from across 11 different institutes or centers at the NIH. And so again, NIGMS will fund you, but you do your work and your research with a mentor in another IC at the NIH campus. Next. How do you identify a mentor? If you are on the, out, the outside of NIH, if you are a grad student and you're interested in doing a postdoc at the NIH, where would you start? Where can you find information on this? 
We'll start with the NIH intramural program website. The NIH intramural program has approximately 1,200 investigators. And on their website, you can search for those investigators by scientific focus or by name. Additionally, the Office of Intramural Training and Education, or OITE, has a webpage on postdoc positions that are available at the NIH. And also you can look for the intramural training directors. These are the dedicated staff at the Institute that, are, that, are, uh, that work with the training and the uh, mentoring of, and the, the training and mentoring of uh, that happens at the Institute, at the respective Institute. So connecting with them could be useful in understanding what opportunities are available at their institutes, but also they could even give you a sense of what is the mentoring track record for uh, a number of investigators, et cetera. <clears throat> Next. As, as Desiree said, <clears throat> it is a competitive application process and it uses the FI2 mechanism. The I stands for intramural. And this is the intramural version of the NIH F32 with some changes that are noted in the funding opportunity announcement. Please, please read everything thoroughly. Please read the funding opportunity announcement very thoroughly and any related notices that, are, that accompany the funding opportunity announcement. Uh, make sure again, you know, there is specific guidance um, that needs that needs to be followed, or your application could be withdrawn. Also, you know, by by applying to the Pratt program, you are either beginning or continuing your record of independent funding. And for example, the Pratt Fellows are listed at, on the NIH Reporter website, and so you can go there, search for FI2, and um, you can see all the different types of research that NIDMS is supporting through the Pratt program. Next. Now, when you apply to the NIH, you go through what's called the NIH application guides. And you can find this at uh, grants.nih.gov.gov. And you will be using for this application, you will be using the guidance for fellowships under the fellowship instructions shown here in the slide. Here I'm showing an image of what the funding opportunity announcement looks like. This is um, the, the top of the funding opportunity announcement or FOA. And you can see the participating organization, that's the NIH and the component that's participating and that's NIGMS. It will also show all of the related notices that accompany this, upper, this funding announcement. You can see um, right now when you go to the FOA, the, the most recent notice is about this webinar. But still, it's good it, you have to look at all these notices because sometimes notices can inform uh, changes in policy or in guidance that can impact the funding opportunity announcement. Next. Now the Pratt application due date is October 4, 2021. Um, the applications will be reviewed next spring and then have a, an earliest start date of approximately late summer slash early fall. Typically um, it starts by September 1st. So how do you, submit your application. You yourself, the postdoc, cannot submit the application. The application needs to be submitted by the institute where the proposal, uh, where the proposed work will take place. You have to work with a designated person at the institute called the AOR or the Authorized Organization Representative. And they, <clears throat> Um, they will submit the application on your behalf and make sure that it's submitted with all of the credentials that are needed. So if you don't know yet, right after this webinar, go and find out who the AOR 
for your preferred institute is and start a conversation with them. Get the ball rolling. You know, this is a person that uh, you're gonna want to uh, work with, that you want to contact early in the process. So, um, and I'll be saying that a few times, contact the AOR early in the process. Be, and please be respectful of their time and their de um, deadlines. Next. Now, before we go on, I'd like to go over some terminology. The institute where you perform the work, for example, NIMH or NINDS, is the applicant. They apply to NIGMS. You, the postdoc, you are the PI and the sole PI of that application. And your preceptor or your mentor is called the sponsor. And you can have multiple sponsors. You can have a primary sponsor with uh, one or, or, or whatever number of co-sponsors. <clears throat> Please ensure that all requirements of the FOA are met. Incomplete applications are returned without review. And this happens every year. And it's quite sad to have to withdraw applications because we all know like submitting a grant is uh, a, a large effort. And so you don't want your application just to be, you know, don't go through review just because you missed something. So it's important that you, you know, demonstrate the integration of the research and training components as well as your training potential in the application. And again, contact your AOR early in the process. <clears throat> now the Pratt application, as opposed to the extramural F32, requires what we call a leadership statement. Again, uh, I, Dr. Salazar mentioned that one of the goals of the program is to prepare people for leadership positions in the biomedical research workforce. And so we ask for a one page leadership statement that describes your own past leadership and service activities in the scientific community or to enhance public engagement and understanding of the scientific research process. We ask fellows to describe uh, their commitment to diversity in the biomedical sciences and their leadership mentoring and outreach activities to enhance diversity, especially involving groups that are underrepresented in the biomedical research enterprise. We also ask for planned activities during the fellowship to develop or enhance your leadership skills. Uh, think about leveraging existing resources, either through a professional society or through your research group or through OITE or any other opportunities that are available. Make sure you take advantage of those to, to receive more leadership, um, more training in leadership skills. And um, the, the leadership statement is a required component of the application. So if the application lacks the leadership statement, it will be deemed incomplete and it will not go forward to review. Now, I'd like to talk a bit about some tips for successful for a successful review. There are five different review criteria for a fellowship application which you can find on section five of the funding opportunity and for opportunity announcement. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each one and what reviewers tend to look for when reviewing applications. First is the fellowship applicant, that's you. It's important that you tell your own story and you clearly articulate your career goals. Think about who you are, where you come from, where you wanna go, and why is the Pratt Fellowship the right mechanism for you uh, to help you get there? It's also important to think about uh, your sponsors, collaborators, and or consultants as these will be your mentors. It's important, it's very important that they provide a detailed and tailored plan for you 
in terms of career development, mentoring and training plan for you. No generic statements, no generic uh, uh, plans. If there are multiple mentors, then explain how they'll work together for your training. And please use the current NIH biosketch format for, um, for, for yourself and for the sponsors and, and, and other key personnel. If you, will, if you have collaborators, then collaborators should submit letters of support. And I want to make the distinction, this is not the same as letters of reference. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you have collaborators, they should submit letters of support. Next, the research training plan. This is the section where you also spend a lot of effort. Um, please have a clear rationale and significance, you know, making sure that it's supported by the literature and uh, or preliminary data that shows feasibility. Think about your central hypothesis in addition to aim specific hypotheses. And you know, the applications with a clear hypothesis tend to do well in review. Your approach should be ambitious, but not unrealistic. Remember, it should be feasible to do in a three year time frame. The aims should be related, but not interdependent. And you should discuss expected outcomes, potential challenges, and alternative strategies. Please put uh, emphasis on the statistical analysis. You know, talk about the sample size, talk about the power analysis, and pay attention to other relevant biological variables, such as sex. Avoid jargon, because as I've mentioned before, uh, these, this covers broad areas of, of research. And so reviewers, the review panel itself will be a broad review panel. So if, avoid um, discipline specific jargon and don't oversell your proposal. Next. There should be a clear training benefit to, uh, to, your, to your fellowship be it uh, learning a new system, learning new techniques, learning uh, new skills, you know, talk about what you want to learn, right? what new skills you, would, you will acquire under this uh, proposed research. And this can also include OITE programs, courses that you wanna take from FAES, which is a, a small graduate school at NIH, um, conferences that you would want to go, et cetera. And, and also include some of the Pratt programming activities that Dr. Salazar mentioned earlier. You know, make sure that you um, have a clear, uh, demonstrate the clear need for this fellowship in terms of the training that you want to receive. And the last um, review criteria is the institutional environment. And that is pretty much, reviewers will look at why is that the best environment to conduct your proposed research training. Why is the environment you are you are um, you, you will be working in is uh, the best one to conduct that research? And I want to make a note here: the entire application is reviewed. So a, just because you'll have a rigorous research proposal that is not sufficient to to get a fantastic you know, score, everything is reviewed from the, the research training plan to the fellowship uh, applicant, the sponsors, the envir environment, the leadership statement, everything is looked at. Next. Now, what are some things that, you know, you can do to get your application withdrawn? Number one is there cannot be multiple applications with the same primary sponsor. Now, a primary sponsor can serve as a co-sponsor and another for another fellow, but they can only serve as a primary sponsor for one fellow. This is because we pretty much fund, you know, one per lab per cycle. 
If you have any missing bio sketch for yourself or your sponsors, a missing leadership statement, again, that will make your application incomplete and it will be withdrawn. And if you have inappropriate or incomplete letters of reference as well. In terms of the letters of reference, three letters are required and your sponsor and collaborators cannot provide reference letters. Next. The submission of the reference letters is through uh, ERA Commons. So it's through a, a separate process from the application submission. And uh, make sure that the people you ask for letters of reference uh, make sure that you provide them with the following information because they will need this to submit your letter. They will need your <clears throat> ERA Commons username. They will need the first and last name as they appear on your ERA Commons profile account and the number of the funding opportunity announcement that I showed you earlier. That is PAR-19 dash 286. <clears throat> because this, is, uh, this goes through a separate process, letters can be submitted well in advance of the application being submitted. So, so ask, ask early. Next. <clears throat> and lastly, I wanna go through some common mistakes. You know, um, as you go through this process, Common mistakes are not giving yourself enough time. You need time to identify the mentor, work on the proposal, contact and work with the AOR on how you will be submitting this application. Another common mistake, like I said before, incom an incomplete application. And also another mistake that some people make is that after you submit your application, but before it is reviewed, you are allowed to um, submit to the scientific review officer um, whether or not a paper was published. If a paper was published between the time that the application was submitted and it's gonna get reviewed, you are allowed to <clears throat> submit that. This is only for um, like publications that are, you know, that are out, that are on press. Next. And now I'll hand it over back to Desiree and you will hear from the Pratt Fellows. Okay, thank you, Edgardo. So now we are going to um, hear from some of the fellows just about their experiences. So we'll start with Philip Adams in NICHD. Great, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I am starting my third year uh, in the Pratt program, but I'm also now um, starting this year a non-tenure track faculty member at NIH. And I'll talk a little bit about how Pratt helped me navigate that transition and continues to do so as well. Um, but my lab studies regulatory RNAs in Borrelia bigdorferi, which is the cause of agent of Lyme disease. And I actually started working on Borrelia as an undergrad and um, and then in graduate school, I worked on Borrelia as well. Uh, I did my graduate work at the University of Central Florida with Dr. Molly Jewett, and I studied um, the contribution of different genes to a Borrelia infection in ticks and also in mice. But um, when I was looking for postdocs, I came to the NIH and worked with Gigi Stores. And initially, I was working um, in E. coli. And uh, what was unique about my, and I think helped my application for Pratt was that I had come up with this idea of, of actually starting my own group in Borrelia. And I was going to use the Pratt program as a training opportunity to apply things that I could learn as a postdoc into launching sort of an independent academic career. Um, and so just recently I applied uh, to another program within NIH. And so at the same time that I'm a Pratt member, I'm also part of the Independent Research Scholars Program at NIH, and I have uh, my own independent group. But let me talk a little bit about why I think the Pratt Program is such a great program. I think it's a very unique training opportunity here at NIH. 
and and that's for a couple of reasons um one i think is that the opportunities that were provided as um, Pratt Fellows is really unique in that it's a very small cohort, but we're very diverse across different institutes. And we have a lot of opportunities to interact with a lot of different people. And regardless of what your career trajectory is, if you wanna stay in academia or if you wanna do something else, you have opportunities to interact with people from lots of different um, careers. And I think that that is, is one of the most valuable things actually. Um, part of the Pratt program is inviting guest speakers, and, and so you can have sort of one-on-one -on -one sessions with sometimes some very high-profile scientists, um, and I think that's really impactful to me. The other thing is that it sort of provides this kind of personalized training experience because it is quite small, and so Pratt was able to help me navigate, you know, they suggested I apply for this other position at NIH, they helped me negotiate that position, um, which all of those things I felt were really valuable to me. And finally, I just wanted to mention that applying to this grant is beneficial regardless of the outcome. I think that it's a really good experience to apply for this grant. And also it follows a very similar structure to other grants, including the K99. And so if you get the Pratt, if you don't get the Pratt, you can roll this application into other grants. And it just gives you a really good experience of what it's like and you know seeing a grant go through the whole process if you've never done that before but i'll stop talking i'm happy to answer questions and i'll i'll pass it on to sophia to, to talk about her experiences a little bit thank you very much philip and yeah sophia Bayas. yes hi my name is sophia Bayas, and i'm a postdoc at the national institute of mental health at the unit of the on the neurobiology of affective memory, which is led by Mario Penso. And uh, a little bit of my educational background, I actually got my PhD in neuroscience from the University of Florida. Um, but yeah, I wanna kinda just to emphasize a little bit of the benefits uh, that I have had for being uh, part of the Pratt program. As uh, Philip mentioned, one of the, uh, I guess the, the main thing would be uh, the, experience, the experience I got just writing grants and applying for for grants, uh, so when I uh, just the experience I, I had putting together my Pratt application made it so that writing my my K ninety nine was uh, a, a much less uh, daunting and scary process. And also having gone through the review process for the Pratt, I also learned some of the things that you know, the, the 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 reviewers were looking for uh, uh, in an application. Then I was able to apply those two for the uh, for my K as well. Um, uh, another big benefit is the um, the professional development and the trainings that we get. For example, uh, prior to being a member of the uh, the Pratt program, I had no idea how to, you know uh, to give a, a chalk talk or a job talk, and and those are some of the activities that we did as a, as, a, as a Pratt fellow. Uh, but also, um, as uh, Desiree mentioned before, we had uh, some leadership skills and management that kind of like also gave me some insight into kind of like the way that I, you know, interact with others in the lab and the strengths uh, and weaknesses and how to improve that. And I think I had benefited a lot from that. Uh, and the last thing I want to just kind of say and emphasize is that also uh, it has given us um, uh, because of the Pratt program uh, and all the activities that we do that many require uh, interactions with many faculty or, or people from uh, 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 leadership positions in other in science. Uh, um, I would say I had been able to expand my network of mentors uh, just uh, for informal uh, 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 for most uh, the the former Pratt director Skenis and Mercedes uh, had you know uh, were uh, excellent mentors and uh, and the current Pratt directors uh, uh, both um, Desiree and Edgardo uh, they they served me to kind kind of like guide me through careers but also through personal roadblocks. And uh, of uh, you know they they were able to offer their advice and resources, uh, but beyond that, uh, like I said, we we give uh, um, we do a lot of these activities uh, with visiting faculty, and and I was able to like talk to them and also get their input, and some of them you know end up being like a, a long term uh, mentors, and now I can reach and ask their advice. Uh, and lastly, just kind of like uh, I also had the opportunity to work and learn from other outstanding fellows uh, uh, throughout the NIH. Um, so that was uh, that was also very uh, beneficial. Um, and with that, yeah, I'll, I'll conclude and 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 I'll let uh, Sophia Hupalu. Great, thank you very much, Sophia. Sophia Hupalu. Hi, yeah, um, 
My name is Sophia Hupolo, and um, I'm starting my, or I guess finishing my second year in the Pratt program, um, finishing my third year as a postdoc overall. Um, so I started my postdoc at the NIH, um, and I applied for the Pratt Fellowship uh, about approximately two months after I started. Um, my background is in behavioral neuroscience. Um, I work in the lab of Dr. Josh Gordon in the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. And my re in my research, I use in vivo electrophysiology and in rodents to study how a loss of function mutation um, in a schizophrenia risk gene affects cognitive function and neural synchrony or communication within brain circuits that support cognition. Um, and so prior to uh, coming to the NIH, I finished my PhD in neuroscience as well at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, I, as I was mentioning earlier, I, you know, came to the, came to the NIH, signed up for a postdoc, then applied, um, and doing that allowed me to sort of work with my postdoc advisor who helped me with my application. Um, and I was getting to know the techniques in the lab. Um, I also highly recommend for those of you who are interested in applying, um, reach out to current Pratt fellows who are already in the program. There's a list of all of us online. Um, ask them what you what they think made their application successful and if they'd be willing to share their applications. Um, also, I highly recommend asking folks in your lab outside of your uh, advisor or um, proposed advisor to read your proposal. Um, that can really, really benefit and strengthen the quality of the proposal. The uh, final thing I want to share and highlight about the Pratt program is the um, amazing source of community and guidance that it has given me and I think for many, most of the other fellows as well. Um, prior to COVID, we used to have regular in-person meetings, um, both for, you know, seminars, as Desiree and Edgardo outlined, but also for professional development events. Um, but then when the world went virtual during the lockdowns, um, the Pratt directors did a really, really amazing job of checking in with everyone and creating opportunities for the fellows to still be able to interact. Um, the Desiree and Edgardo, as well as the prior uh, directors, Kenny and Mercedes, really are super incredibly supportive and go out of their way in their busy work and life schedules to, to help out um, the fellows. And um, in my experience, I was personally interested in uh, pursuing um, science policy and uh, pursuing a career as a program officer at the NIH. And so, um, the project directors were highly supportive of that, and they uh, wrote, helped write me a letter of recommendation to apply for the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Um, and, you know, without that support, I definitely wouldn't have been successful in doing so. So um, just a really strong pitch for um, this being not only an amazing scientific training environment, but also very supportive in terms of um, allowing fellows to pursue your career interests as well. So I'll hand it off to Tommy now. Thanks. Thank you, Sophia. And last but not least, Tommy Vo. Hi, everyone. I'm Tommy, and I just graduated from the prior program last year. Um, I just want to say that I fully agree with everything that was just said. So I'll just add a little bit about my own experiences. So I did my PhD at Cornell where I studied protein interaction networks. And then when I joined for a postdoc at the National Cancer Institute, I changed research direction completely. And I focused on understanding how epigenetic gene regulation happens. Going into my postdoc, my own career goal was to become a faculty at a research institute. And right now I'm currently transitioning to becoming a tenure track assistant professor at a Michigan State this coming fall. I personally feel that this fellowship was a really big help in achieving my training and career goals. I, I think that some of the key features of the program uh, includes learning how to effectively communicate science, it includes gaining leadership skills, and it includes having a solid professional support group. 
As the elders have mentioned, there are so many opportunities uh, within the PrEP program to learn how to communicate and to lead. And I think some of the most helpful for me were one, fellows get to invite different speakers for weekly mini seminars. And for me, through interactions with these people, I learned how to communicate better and how to uh, make my own science more accessible to others outside of my area of expertise. Two, uh, fellows get to host an annual Pratt Research Symposium. Last year, I was a co-host of the symposium and we were very fortunate enough to invite fantastic uh, scientific leaders in order to learn more about their science and other professional insights. And third, uh, starting last year, we actually started doing mock chalk talks and being able to get valuable feedback from both peers and NIHPIs. I think that this practice was extremely beneficial for me when I went on to a faculty in job interviews. And last but not least, I just want to mention that uh, as Philip had mentioned before, the Pratt group is a very small and interconnected group. There are only about 20 to 25 fellows being funded at any one time, but we have many alumni from many years ago that are oftentimes great professional contact, contacts and references. The program directors also become your mentors who will help you to develop professionally. Altogether, in addition to support from your primary research group, I really think that support and the mentorship that you get from the Pratt program really helps NIH postdocs with their training and career aspirations. And I'll also be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for that. So just um, lastly, before we move to the question and answer um, period, just a, a reminder for the timeline for the 2022 recruitment. So the application deadline is October 4th. These applications will get reviewed in February or March of 2022. And then we should make funding decisions in May or June and notify, begin notifying the fellows and fellows will start in September, uh, September 1st, 2022. So I encourage you to have a look at the Pratt homepage, to look at the funding opportunity announcement and read that very carefully. And definitely feel free to send emails to myself and Edgardo um, and follow us at NIGMS training. Um, so with that, um, we will move to the question and answer. Um, included on the slides, I'm going to go quickly because we don't have a lot of time left, but there are other opportunities of funding that NIGMS uh, provides for fellows who are interested in doing research outside of NIH. Okay, and so um, this is uh, the group of our, our current fellows, and um, now we will take questions. Okay, so um, there's uh, several questions and there was one for the fellows. I'll start with those. So question for the, the scholars. So what is your typical week as a Pratt scholar and what are some of the leadership and outreach activities that you've benefited the most from? I mean, I think it's pretty much like a standard postdoc in most regards. Um, the difference is that as a Pratt fellow, we meet every two weeks, usually with just the Pratt fellows for a two hour session where sometimes someone presents their work or sometimes there's an invited guest um, or sometimes we have these career training opportunities. So that's sort of the, the, the gist of, but for the most, I mean, most of the time is just we're in our labs doing our research. It's the most of our, our life. Okay, and I'm not sure if this applies to any of you, um, but the question is if anyone applied as a graduate student, um, did you apply for other postdocs during the application cycle? So were you guys all here and you applied first? Yeah, so I think it's often pretty common that individuals will will join a lab and and then apply some do apply as grad students but i would um advise you to only do so if you're committed to coming to nih and what and that that 
decision is not dependent upon receiving the fellowship. So in some, it, the, the review process is quite a long time. So in a, a, I think for a few years, we've had graduate students apply, but then they don't get notified in time because it's not till you know June or so. And then by that time, they've already uh, joined a different lab. Um, you know, even if we want to make an award. So I would only encourage you to apply if you're really committed to coming to NIH and not having um, that decision be dependent upon getting into the PrEP program. Um, there's a question about, um, are you required to finish your postdoc during the three-year fellowship? So no. Um, Plenty of um, fellows will will be in this program for three years and will continue in the lab for you know one or a few years past. Um, so it's not required. Um, so your funding will be provided by NIGMS for those three years, and then your uh, mentor will be responsible for it. I see one here. Who can be a sponsor? Any tenure track or tenured investigator in the intramural uh, program at NIH? And there's a question about um, examples of grants. So we do not share those, but as uh, Sophia mentioned, you can reach out to the fellows who are funded. And I believe some of the NIH um, Institute's training offices have copies of old applications. So you could reach out to the training directors um, at the institute that you'll you would be working on. Um, yeah, so there was a question about um, is it ideal to identify a prep mentor before applying to the program? So yeah, that is a requirement. You must have um, a, a sponsor identified and apply through um, that institute's AOR will submit the application. So you cannot apply without first identifying a sponsor. Okay, let's see. There's one question about um, NIH postdoc positions for non-US citizens. So yeah, there yeah. So non-US citizens can be postdocs in the intramural program. You, don't, you just cannot apply to the Pratt program, but but you can be a postdoc at the NIH. Uh, I would suggest uh, looking at that uh, the OITE page on uh, positions that are available. Maybe start there, uh, but also go to the intramural uh, research uh, website. I saw a question about whether. Um preprint publications from bio, bio archives can be included. And yes, absolutely. Um, those should be included in your, um, in your bio sketch, those count as publications. The only note is that um, we mentioned that if as long as it's 30 days before the applications get reviewed, you're able to share if something was pending is now published, you can share that. But you cannot share a, a preprint in that period because you choose when that um, when that's submitted. Um. Um, there was a question that I think I can speak to about aside from the sponsor and the PI, who else needs to include bio sketches? Um, so I had a consultant on my application, and so for the reason for that was because I was in the lab of an. NIH Institute director. And so I kind of thought that um, when reviewers would be going over my application, they would, it would be a concern that those folks are super busy and um, might not be, it might be nice to have a supplemental sort of consultant who'd be providing me with supplemental training. So I included a consultant who's a staff scientist in my lab and he had to provide a bio sketch. So I think um, if you list a consultant, they're for sure um, going to uh, need a bio sketch. And I guess I, um, I also, when I was a graduate student, I had an F31 NRSA. And I also had a consultant for another reason who also needed to provide bio sketches. And the consultant in that scenario was um, going to assist me with 
or teaching me a technique that my PhD advisor wasn't super familiar with. So they wrote a letter um, in addition to a bio sketch, they sort of wrote a letter um, saying that they would, you know, have expertise in this area and they could provide me with the training that uh, to supplement that of my PI. Thank you. Okay, so let's see, we just have a couple more minutes. Um, so can a sponsor who already has a Pratt Fellow in their lab sponsor a new applicant? Um, yes, they can. So they can only sponsor one applicant um, per year, um, but there are, there are um, sponsors who have multiple Pratt Fellows um, up, above different years. Um, so yeah, that is still an option. Um, there's a question about preliminary data, um, especially for folks applying as graduate students. Um, so preliminary data is typically included, but oftentimes if you're not in the lab yet, it's not your own preliminary data, but it's preliminary data from the lab. But if any of the fellows have any comments. Yeah, for me, I only have one piece of preliminary data and that was from the literature. <laughs> so. Me too. I had I had some uh, preliminary data, but it was it was clearly very preliminary, and, <laughs> and it was just, um, just uh, other uh, figures just showing that I could do a technique or that the technique was implemented in a in a different study. Yeah, pretty much the same for me as well. And there's um, a question. Um, Dr. Bo mentioned transitioning into a tenure track position at an R01. At an R1 institution, does the PrEP program provide guidance in transitioning out of the NIH intramural system? Absolutely. Like we had so many workshops, so many trainings, uh, invited speakers all talking about those kinds of things. Like we had a lot of workshops and trainings on K grants, R grants, all the different ways you can write them, what makes a successful grant. We had invited speakers from academia and stuff. So they become contacts as well, right? So there was a lot of opportunities. Yes, so um, also one of the things that we did uh, this uh, cycle was that uh, s s some of the Pratt Fellows, um, we identified who were applying for positions and we made a kind of a super system in which we kind of like review each other's applications and uh, critique each other's uh, job talks and, and chalk talks and and that was uh, very, very helpful because, um, you know, I think uh, uh, several people, it's uh, better than, you know, one. So, yes. Okay, so one last question was, are there um, annual reports similar to the F31? So there is um, kind of a, an annual progress report um, that you submit uh, just to the program directors. And we do have one-on-one -on -one meetings every year uh, with the fellows to review their progress and part of their individual development plan to make sure they're on the right track um, to get to where you know they want to go. And, and we try to make sure they have appropriate resources and are um, keeping track with their individual development plan. But I see we are at three o'clock. And so we will be posting a recording of this as well as the slides. And if we did not get a chance to answer your questions, please send an email to Edgardo or I, and um, we look forward to, to seeing your applications and hearing from you. Thank you very much for coming.